Hello everyone, my name is Claire Skinner, as you've just heard, and I'm Principal Archivist for Wiltshire and Swindon History Centre, which is in Chippenham, uh, which is in North West Wiltshire. And um, just a word about the History Centre, it's um, a combined service, so we have the archive service for both Wiltshire County and Swindon Borough, so we're joint funded. Uh, plus we have the local studies service, the museum's advisory service, the archaeology and historic buildings record, and the art service for Wiltshire Council. And I'm going to be talking today about the Laycock Unlocked project, which is an HLF funded project completing this year, which was started in 2012, which included the creation of a mobile phone app created by and designed uh, for young people. To set things in context, I'm going to give you a bit more information about Laycock, the archives, and why we decided to develop the app. So, for those of you who haven't ever been, I thoroughly recommend it. Laycock is a village about four miles south of us, um, and Laycock Abbey was originally an Augustinian nunnery founded in the 13th century, which at the dissolution of the monasteries went into lay hands and passed to a family called the Talbots. And the Abbey Estates included much of the village of Laycock. Um, and by having a continuous ownership over many centuries, the village itself has remained pretty unspoiled compared to others. And um, it was um, handed over to the National Trust, donated by Matilda Talbot, the last private owner of the estate in 1944. And that has ensured the ongoing preservation of this uh, remarkable community. And of course, being what is in effect a museum in a village form, um, it is very popular as a film and TV set, and even if you've never been, you no doubt will have seen it in many films and TV programmes, such as Cranford, shown here, and uh, films such as the Harry Potter films. Film, of course, is the offspring of photography, and photography owes its origins to a former owner of Laycock, William Henry Fox Talbot, who... Um, in 19, uh, sorry, 1839 became the first person to publish details of making negatives from which any number of positive prints can be made, earning him the moniker, the father of modern photography, although of course there were a lot of other people working on it at that time. And in 2009, we were put in a position of would we like to buy the Laycock Abbey Estate Archives? Um, and of course the answer to that is yes please, but we can't do it on our own. Um, it was an important collection for local, national and international history, and it included not only the estate papers of Laycock Abbey, but um, material from the East India Company. So it had a very wide in, uh, ranging interest. And um, the collection's high valuation, it was valued at over £500,000, meant that we had to apply to the Heritage Lottery Fund for a heritage grant, which we began to do in 2011 when the owner made it clear they absolutely were going to sell. So, um, in the process of applying to HLF, we were encouraged to look afresh at our audiences and identify areas for development. And I suspect in common with many other archive services in the public sector, one of our most significant areas for development were young people aged 16 to 24. So in order to address this, we began to work with Wiltshire College's Creative Wiltshire interactive media unit students and um, they and their producer Richard White who's here today and who's going to help me at the Q&A later came up with the idea of creating a location aware mobile phone app 
for both iPhone and Android devices, so something that is triggered by GPS. Richard had already uh, produced a number of locative media apps, and he is the real expert here on this. So um, he built on that experience and felt that um, this would be a good way of connecting between the archives and the technology. And I think Fox Talbot would have approved of us creating an app to encourage people to use the latest digital media technology while visiting a place associated with the birth of photography. And in the first phase of the app development, uh, which was when we were writing the stage two bid in January to May 2012, uh, we gave uh, the students a brief which encouraged them to create something with the look and feel of a game initially. And that's something that I believe some of you will have heard about uh, gamification yesterday. And the aim of that was collecting virtual objects as you went round the village. So um, as part of that process, the students came to the History Centre and photographed archives, but the selection of material was led by archive staff because at that point the collection was uncatalogued apart from a basic box list, so we were the ones who knew what it contained. In um, the second phase of the app development, the game element was dropped because we found that too restrictive and it was actually also too technically challenging. Um, it went beyond the students' abilities to deliver with the necessary level of complexity and interactivity. Um, the first gamified prototype would have forced visitors to go round the village in a particular direction as well, which um, it, obviously not every visitor wants to do. So that was another reason why we gave up on that and moved to something different. We were delighted to learn in November 2012 that our bid had been successful. And we were awarded just over 500,000 by a combination of HLF, the Friends of the National Libraries, and Wiltshire Council. And work began almost immediately on the second phase of the app, even before we'd signed the contract with the owner of the archive. So I have to say that was a bit of a nervous period. Um, but it, it was necessary to do that to fit in with college deadlines. We wanted the app to have a strong link to real life stories and people discovered in the Laycock archives. So we used a group of volunteers who had been box listing the collection for some time to uncover exciting and interesting stories. The new version was still location aware and involved traveling around the village, but it wasn't as prescriptive as the previous version. And the idea was that every interaction would be linked to an arch a specific archive item and an engaging story developed shedding light on the village and the estate archive. Um, it, you'll see in a moment, I'm going to demonstrate it, but they're kind of like little vignettes. Um, it doesn't try and tell the story of Laycock over time or anything as kind of uh, prescriptive as that. It's much more, oh, now you're here, let's tell you about this you might not have known that. So um, I, I quite like that, that aspect of it. Um, it was very important to get the local community on board and they were consulted about what they felt happy to share in the creation of the app. And one of them, Michael Potter, very kindly consented to let us use his father, who's very fortuitously called Harry Potter, um, <laughs> who was the village postman for many years, as the narrator of the app. Um, for some of the students whose only knowledge of Laycock was as a film set, um, uh, the Harry Potter connection was a breakthrough moment for them. Richard um, worked with creative writing and music technology students from Wiltshire College and local volunteer actors, including members of the local community, to create and record soundscapes for a set of locations around the village, each linked, as I've said, to an archive. 
And all being well, I'm going to play one for you now. So you can see there, um, you um, can click on the point and it will play. In the 1880s, the little cottage next to the Red Lion Hotel was the coffee tavern, the home of our temperance society. No alcohol was sold in there. They thought it would be the ruin of us all. Letter from William John March at the Coffee Tavern, Laycock to C.H. Talbot, Esquire, 28th of October, 1892. Please find enclosed programme of annual entertainment for Thursday next. Can I have the honour of your patronage in common with other ladies and gentlemen of the neighbourhood? Should the concert prove a success, I intend recovering bagatelle boards and making the house more attractive. I am glad to say that we have mastered the unruly element. We do not allow drinking, smoking, gambling or swearing on the premises. They had some fun in there even without a drink. They used to have the bagatelle tables out the back. A bit like your modern pinball machines, but without the flashing lights. When the upstairs room was opened, they wanted the table up there. Couldn't get it up the stairs, so they just cut a hole in the ceiling to get it in. <laughs> I had to get Mr. Gale, the carpenter, in to fix that. So, you get the idea there, and, um, thank you. The um, the soundscape sort of I think was re really important. The the same music is kind of used. Um, I think I'm right in saying, Richard, as as you go round, you'll hear that, and that indicates to you um, that yes, you've now uh, triggered another little vignette, as it were. Okay. So the. Um, the app was built using App Furnace uh, by Richard and a designer developer called Agnita Gorka from Wiltshire College and was published to the App Store and Google Play. The beta version was published for consultation in July 2014 and a final version was published in December 2014. Then this year we had a desktop version which was designed and published in July 2015. But this final piece of work had to be contracted out to a professional company called Calvium. Uh, unfortunately, Wiltshire College, in their wisdom, has closed down their creative media unit, uh, which I think was a very short-sighted thing to do. But despite that closure, it's hoped that the process of designing and developing the app has been a valuable experience in project development work for those creative media and heritage students. The project engaged students from creative writing, music technology, media production, and creative computing. The students who worked on the project gained high grades, I'm told, and three students from the original team are now working in the creative industries which we're really delighted about. And the app is now being promoted via our website, via bookmarks, which you've all got. Please do take them away and have a go for yourselves. Um, in the National Trust shop in Laycock itself, and there's a huge banner when you first arrive at the village by, uh, which has got the um, QR code so people can scan and download the app when they arrive, hopefully. So, lessons learned. Um, I think working on a real-world project with FE and HE partners brings in a whole new set of stakeholders and agendas. It's very different from a straight commercial transaction where you give a brief to a, a company and they should fulfill it, and if they don't, they don't get paid. You know, it's a different relationship. Um, and of course, from our point of view, it's made it a lot cheaper to use the students. But there's been an awful in lot of investment of staff time and effort, and that mustn't be ignored. You know, these things are not cost neutral by any means. 
However, there are lots of other benefits that go beyond the financial one. The students needed clear direction and support from media and archive professionals, but they made up for it with creativity and enthusiasm. And it was really fantastic to see them getting engaged by you know, what um, many of them may have thought were dusty, boring old records beforehand. Um, with the FEHE tie-on, we needed um, to have longer production cycles. Um, they have their own milestones. I touched on this earlier. You, you know, we had to fit in with their term time and their goals. And so those, those milestones and our milestones needed careful negotiation. We're hoping that by having involved our target audience in the creation of this product, it will increase user buy-in. But this is something that probably needs more research. I have to say, we haven't yet done a huge amount of user consultation, and that's the next step, really, for us. Um, it's been very beneficial to have um, complementary branding across our website, across the app and social media, and that was possible only because Richard worked very closely with a chap called Rob Escott who designed the website. So that was really, really helpful. Working with the community, um, I would say don't ever underestimate how much community consultation you will need. We thought a lot of this would be very uncontroversial, very straightforward. We were dealing with stories about people from hundreds of years ago, so they can't possibly be controversial, can they? That wasn't the way everyone in the community felt. For example, uh, I had a 19th century court case of a chap um, who was being punished for stealing walnuts, which I just thought was quite fun and entertaining. But because it was a name that was very well established in the village, um, I had several people say to me, oh, I'm not sure you should use that because you know, they don't want to have their reputation tarnished. Well, I don't think stealing walnuts is going to damage anyone's reputation. So we went ahead and used it. But there was one case where uh, we discovered that actually a story that um, we'd read in one of the archives turned out not to be true. There was um, allegedly a, a connection to the family of Neville Chamberlain um, uh, in the village. And the, um, the people who lived at this property where allegedly the Chamberlain family came from were very angry at the implication that he was going to be associated with the village formally through the app, when in fact this was misinformation and he wasn't related to that family. Um, and, you know, I think that's something where you do have to be sensitive to us. You know, that didn't matter particularly, but obviously Neville Chamberlain is a controversial character and people were worried about the association of the village with him. Um, we did find there were certain Chinese whispers, you know, people would be telling us that somebody in the village was upset. You know, initially we were told that Michael Potter was upset, uh, that he didn't want his father to be used. But when I went and spoke to him face to face, he was absolutely fine. And it was just that he hadn't really heard enough about it beforehand. Um, and obviously we wouldn't have done it without consulting him. Um, but people were kind of jumping ahead of the gun and, and telling him about it before I'd had the chance to consult him. So, you know, I don't know how you can control that. That's just working with people, isn't it? But um, I certainly find that, you know, giving people a cup of tea and a, a chat and sort of trying to work through their fears has been very effective. The, the big thing is we wanted to be seen to be listening to the community. So we went to various events. Um, there, there's a tenants association, for example, and we, we spoke to them to try and allay their fears. And I think overall that worked. Working with your council IT department, <laughs> that's been one of the most challenging things. And actually, you know, we, we think about 
um, advocacy externally and engagement externally, you have to remember to engage internally as well because we had this stupid situation that the rest of the world could see our desktop app but we couldn't see it because it wouldn't play within the council firewall. They had just excluded access to mob uh, mobile phone apps. So this is something where we had to you know, do some negotiation with the head of IT to sort of promote the value of the product. Um, very frustrating because you'd think they would see the business benefits of working with social media, but sometimes they're, they're really cautious. Okay, so um, just a quick whiz through some of the other aspects of the project. Um, we've had a group of over 100 volunteers engaged and I know we've talked uh, already this morning about the value of getting volunteers who are really invested in your project. And I think what's exciting for us is they not only um, are concerned about LACOC, but they've become very engaged with archives in general and are wanting to do other things with us, even though they don't relate to LACOC. So that's been fantastic. We've managed to create an online community archive, which now has over 50 oral histories. Um, and there's been a whole load of outreach and education work, as you might expect. Good old HLF, they um, do encourage us to, to sort of really make archives more accessible, which is fantastic. And um, in September of this year, we held our final celebratory event and launched the app at that event. So we just uh, just want to finish by saying a few thank yous. Thank you to the National Trust and the local community for their support. Of course, to Richard and the students, without whom this wouldn't have happened. And I think um, if you do come to LACOP, please do try out the app as um, a, you know, a GPS-triggered app rather than a, a desktop version and see how it works for yourself. Laycock is an amazing place. We're very lucky to have it on our doorstep. And I think Fox Tolbert would be extremely pleased to see how its history is being brought to life in such a modern way. Thank you.